The Lady Amalthea grew as much more beautiful every day as that day was grimmer and gloomier than the one before. The old men at arms, coming down drenched and shivering from walking their posts in the rain, or in from stealing things for the King, opened as quietly as flowers when they met her on the stairs or in the hallways. She would smile at them and speak gently, but when she had passed by, the castle always seemed darker than ever, and the wind outside would rattle the thick sky like a sheet on a clothesline. For her beauty was human and doomed, and there was no comfort in it for old men. They could only draw their dripping cloaks tighter and limp on down to the small fire in the scullery. But the Lady Amalthea and Prince Lear walked and spoke and sang together as blithely as though King Haggard's castle had become a green wood, wild and shadowy with spring. They climbed the crooked towers like hills, picnicked in stone meadows under a stone sky, and splashed up and down stairways that had softened and quickened into streams. He told her everything he knew, and what he thought about all of it, and happily invented a life and opinions for her, which she helped him do by listening. Nor was she deceiving him, for she truly remembered nothing before the castle and him. She began and ended with Prince Lear, except for the dreams, and they soon faded, as he said that they would. They seldom heard the hunting roar of the red bull at night any more, but when the hungering sound came to her ears, then she would be frightened, and the walls and the winter would grow up around them again, as though their spring were all of her making, her joy's gift to the prince. He would have held her at such times, but he had long known her dread of being touched. One afternoon, the Lady Amalthea stood on the highest tower of the castle, watching for Prince Lear's return from an expedition against a brother-in-law of the ogre he had slain for he still went out on occasion errantries, as he had told Molly that he might. The sky was piled up over the valley of Hagsgate, the color of dirty soap, but it was not raining. Far below, the sea slid out toward the smoky horizon in hard bands of silver and green and kelpie brown. The ugly birds were restless. They flew out often, two and three together, circled swiftly over the water, and then returned to strut on the sand, chortling and cocking their heads at King Haggard's castle in the cliff. Said so, said so! The tide was low and near to turning. The Lady Amalthea began to sing, and her voice balanced and hovered in the cold air like another sort of bird. I am a king's daughter, and I grow old within the prison of my person, the shackles of my skin, and I would run away and beg from door to door. She did not remember having heard the song before, but the words pinched and plucked at her like children, trying to drag her back to some place that they wanted to see again. She moved her shoulders to get away from them. But I am not old, she said to herself, and I am no prisoner. I am the Lady Amalthea, beloved of Lear, who has come into my dreams so that I might not doubt myself when I sleep. Where I could have learned, where could I have learned a song of sorrow? I am the Lady Amalthea, and I know only the songs that Prince Lear has taught me. She lifted a hand to touch the mark on her forehead. The sea wheeled by, calm as the zodiac, and the ugly birds screamed. It troubled her a little that the mark would not go away. Your Majesty, she said, though there had been no sound. She heard the rustling chuckle at her back and turned to see the king. He wore a gray cloak over his mail, but his head was bare. The black lines on his face showed where the fingernails of age had skidded down the hard skin, but he looked stronger than his son and wilder. "'You are quick for what you are,' he said, "'but slow, I think, for what you were. "'It is said that love makes men swift and women slow. "'I will catch you at last if you love much more.' She smiled at him without replying. She never knew what to say to the pale, 
eyed old man whom she so rarely saw, except as a movement on the edge of solitude that she shared with Prince Lear. Then armour winked deep in the valley, and she heard the scrape of a weary horse stumbling on stone. "'Your son is coming home,' she said. "'Let us watch him together.' King Haggard came slowly to stand beside her at the parapet, but he gave no more than a glance to the tiny, glinting figure riding home. "'Nay, what concern have you or I with Lear, truly?' he asked. "'He's none of mine, either by birth or belonging. I picked him up somewhere else that had set him down, thinking that I had never been happy and never had a son. It was pleasant enough at first, but it died quickly.' All things die when I pick them up. I do not know why they die, but it has always been so, save for the one dear possession that has not turned cold and dull as I guarded it, the only thing that has ever belonged to me. His grim face gave the sudden, starved leap of a sprung trap, and Lear will be of no help to you in finding it, he said. He has never even known what it is. Without warning, the whole castle sang like a plucked string as the beast, asleep in its root, shifted his dire weight. The Lady Amalthea caught her balance easily, being well used to this, and said lightly, The Red Bull. But why do you think I have come to steal the bull? I have no kingdom to keep and no wish for conquest. What would I do with him? How much does he eat? Do not mock me, the king answered. The red bull is no more mine than the boy is, and he does not eat and he cannot be stolen. He serves anyone who has no fear, and I have no more fear than I have rest. Yet the Lady Amalthea saw forebodings sliding over the long gray face, scuttling in the shadows of brows and bones. Do not mock me, he said. Why will you play that you have forgotten your quest, and that I am to remind you of it? I know what you have come for, and you know very well that I have it. Take it, then. Take it if you can, but do not dare to surrender now. The black wrinkles were all on edge like knives. Prince Lear was singing as he rode, though the Lady Amalthea could not yet hear the words. She said quietly to the king, My lord, in all of your castle, in all your realm, in all the kingdoms that the Red Bull may bring you, there is only one thing I desire, and you have just told me that he is not yours to give or to keep. Whatever it is you treasure, that is not he. I truly wish you joy of it. Good day, your majesty. She moved towards the tower stairway, but he stood in her way, and she paused, looking at him with her eyes as dark as hoofprints in the snow. The Grey King smiled, and a strange kindness for him chilled her for an instant, for she suddenly fancied that they were somehow alike. But then he said, I know you. I almost knew you as soon as I saw you out on the road, coming to my door with your cook and your clown. Since then, there is no movement of yours that has not betrayed you. A pace, a glance, a turn of the head, the flash of your throat as you breathe, even the way you stand, perfectly still. They were all my spies. You have made me wonder for a little while, and in my own way I am grateful. But your time is done. He looked seaward over his shoulder, and suddenly stepped to the parapet, with the thoughtless grace of a young man. The tide is turning, he said. Come and see it. Come here. He spoke very softly but his voice suddenly held the crying of the ugly birds on the shore. Come here, he said fiercely. Come here, I won't touch you. Prince Lear sang, I will love you as long as I can, however long that may be. The horrible head on his saddle was harmonizing in the kind of boss facetto. The Lady Amalthea went to stand with the king. The waves were coming in under the thick, swirling sky growing as slowly as trees as they bulged across the sea. 
They crouched as they neared the shore, arching their backs higher and higher, and then sprang up the beach as furiously as trapped animals bounding at a wall and falling back with a sobbing snarl to leap up again and again, claws caked and breaking, while the ugly birds yelled mournfully. The waves were gray and green as pigeons until they broke, and then they were the color of the hair that blew across his eyes. There. A strange high voice said close to her, There they are! King Haggard was grinning at her and pointing down to the white water. There they are, he said, laughing like a frightened child. There they are. Say that they are not your people. Say that you did not come here searching for them. Say now that you have stayed all winter in my castle for love. He could not wait for her answer, but turned away to look at the waves. His face was changed beyond believing, delight coloring the somber skin, rounding over the cheekbones and loosening the bowstring mouth. They are mine, he said softly. They belong to me. The Red Bull gathered them for me, one at a time, and I bade him drive each one into the sea. What better place could there be to keep unicorns, and what other cage could hold them? For the bull keeps guard over them awake or asleep, and he daunted their hearts long ago. Now they live in the sea, and every tide still carries them within an easy step of the land, but they dare not take that step. They dare not come out of the water. They are afraid of the Red Bull. Nearby, Prince Lear sang, Others may offer more than they give, all that they have for as long as they live. 